Hello, everyone. Another episode of uh, Developer Advocate Stories. And with me, Kate. Hi, Kate. How are you? Good. How are you? Very good. Very good. Um, still in the COVID, uh, but uh, trying to, to live the life as we can. Uh, so uh, can you tell me a little bit about you, the company that you work? Yeah, so I work for JFrog. I'm a developer advocate there, obviously. And uh, we build DevOps tools for developers. Our flagship product, I guess the one people are most familiar with is Artifactory, which is a universal uh, binary repository manager. It's kind of like, um, like source control for your compiled binaries. But we do also have our own CI CD tool called uh, Pipelines. We have a vulnerability detection tool called X Ray. It's a end to end DevOps solution. And recently we released a, a free tier of that. So now just like anybody can use it for their personal projects or whatever. Great. And uh, a little bit about you. You started as a developer. What's happened uh, before this one? Yeah, I started um, as like a as a web developer doing like WordPress and uh, Joomla templates for people. And then I decided that I was kind of tired of doing that and I wanted to do a little bit more. So I went to a coding boot camp. I don't have a computer science degree. Um, I did go to college, but not for computer science. And also I dropped out. So uh, after I went to the boot camp, I started at JFrog as an engineer on their IoT team. And we built a pretty cool proof of concept demonstrating fast over the air updates for cars. Um, we may not like to think of cars as IoT devices, but the reality is that there is at least three or four computers in any given car and in the really modern ones, considerably more than that. It is a data center on wheels. so. It kind of seems odd that for the overwhelming majority of them, Tesla is absolutely an exception here. They can't be updated remotely. You have to physically take them to a service center to do it. And it can take hours and there isn't like an easy way to update them. Uh, updating them frequently means just like reflashing the device, which we thought kind of sucked. So we built something that allowed us to do that over the air in very little time, somewhere between like 30 and 50 seconds for an application update and like five to 10 minutes for like a full firmware update could happen while the car was driving actually. So it was, it was pretty, pretty cool. So I spent my first year at JFrog doing that, not doing developer advocacy. <laughs> and how, 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 how did you jump to this one? That demo was incredibly flashy. Uh, everybody wanted to hear about it. Everybody wanted to hear about like what we did from a technical perspective, but the other engineers on my team weren't as interested in being on stage. There were only three of us on the team and they, they didn't really want to be on stage. Um, our tech lead didn't mind talking about it, but he wasn't passionate about it. And the other guy like flat out would not do it. So I ended up doing it. And I had a really good time and we had just hired a new director of DevRel and I guess he saw one of my presentations and liked it, uh, flew up from the Sunnyvale office to me in Seattle and uh, just straight up asked me to move to his team. And I, I waffled on it a little because I didn't wanna be one of those developer advocates that doesn't write code anymore. Um, but he promised me I would get to spend as much time coding as I wanted. So I waffled on it for a couple of weeks and then jumped ship. And I, I don't regret that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and did he lie or you are still writing code? No, I do still write code. And it is as much code as I want to write. I actually have Fridays on my calendar blocked off just for coding. I don't always actually use it for that. It's more of a way to make sure that like people don't put meetings on my calendar. But if, if I want to build like a new demo that's really involved, I can. I have a lot of control over what I do in the course of mm -hmm. getting my job done. So if that means writing code, I can do that if I want to. And, and so, what no, else, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, to do what you want, <laughs> this yeah. is the most important thing, that uh, things that you enjoy. Uh, and yeah. you know, th there is like a kind of major what you are expected to do, what uh, you know, can you share with us, of course? Um, 
So KPIs, uh, like goals measurement for developer relations is, is weird because a lot of it is like a community thing, at least the way JFrog is doing developer relations. And it's kind of, it's hard to measure that beyond just like things like engagement. You know, we're like, we're really far away from sales functionally. So it's sometimes it's kind of hard to like put a, a dollar amount on what we do. Um, but community sentiment matters a lot. And a big part of my job is being likable and credible myself. So that the fact that I publicly work at JFrog and publicly represent JFrog online at conferences when, you know, we're not in lockdown, that that matters, <clears throat> you know, yeah. it makes them look good. If I, if the community likes me and I work at JFrog, that, that makes JFrog look good. So that's, that's a big part of, um, what I do in the course of my job, which means a lot of content that is designed like specifically just to be helpful. It's not thinly veiled product pitches. It's literally just like, you don't know what DevOps is. You don't know what CICD is. Cool. I'll teach a 101 workshop on this for free. And we just so happen to be using JFrog products, but we're not going to harassed you afterwards. You're not going to get a bunch of marketing emails from me. A salesperson is not going to call you and on and on and on. Um, so it's, it's a lot for me personally about just genuinely being helpful, being an asset to the community. And if I happen to use JFrog products in the course of that, great. And, and how works the, the interaction? You, you, you go to forums, uh, Twitter, how do you find the people that really need some help and, uh, and you try to help them? Um, so we have several developer advocates on our team and all of us take like somewhat different approaches. I focus really, really heavily on uh, Twitter personally. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a LinkedIn and sometimes I post stuff there, but I don't get a lot of traction or engagement there. And it's, it doesn't feel like that's what LinkedIn is for, you know, but um, I get a lot of traction through Twitter. I have uh, something like 13,000 followers. So it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's not a huge amount of reach, but it's significant enough that like oh, no, somebody kidding. in my network was... knows somebody who wants to learn from me. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. Twitter a lot. And also I still keep in touch with the boot camp I graduated from. Mm -hmm. So I do do some work with them. Sometimes I'll teach a one-on-one class to their, uh, uh, students like a, a DevOps 101 workshop. Uh, um, I also work with a couple of nonprofits that are like a little bit more targeted that are specifically for like getting women involved in tech or other underrepresented minorities in the U.S. into tech. So interesting. <clears throat> yeah, it's it's also good for the soul and also uh, uh, giving back. It's uh, I believe it's very important. So maybe the, the not not maybe the last question, Kate. Uh, can you share uh, you know, something something interesting, a uh, cool story or funny story, weird story that you had during your, your job as developer advocate? Um, so everybody, I think everybody has had like a, a live demo go badly at some point. Uh, and that's something we should normalize. Like, um, don't feel bad if your live demo uh, doesn't go the way you expect. Uh, something crashes because like, it happens all the time and it happens so often, honestly, that I'm convinced that if it doesn't happen in your demo, the audience thinks it's fake. <laughs> so of course I've had that happen to me uh, before. Um, funny though, cause that's never, that's never funny. That's always like more the funny. Is funny. <laughs> yeah, to the other people, to the audience, it's funny. Yeah. I've had um, I've had a laptop fail on me in the middle of a presentation on stage, you know, when we were still allowed to do that. Um, and that like, it was my MacBook issued by work and it hard crashed like, I don't know, 15 slides into like a 65 slide presentation. And there was just nothing I could do. Like I stood there, I, this was really early in my career too. So I didn't know that this was a thing that happened occasionally. I was terrified and I stood there like frantically trying to reboot my computer and it would not turn on. It was fully charged. Uh, it just, it, it just crashed. There was nothing I could do about it. Fortunately, this was at um, a conference in Tel Aviv actually. Okay. Fortunately, they had a backup computer and I was able to get my slides off of that. But the result was that, you know, I'd spent like 12 minutes at this point trying to 
juggle between like my crashed computer and the new computer trying to get my presentation back up out of a 40 minute slot. So I had to like really speed run the rest of the talk. And it was just like, it was not good. Like that one mistake, it, it wasn't my fault. There was nothing I could do to prevent that, but it ruined the whole talk. And I feel really bad for that audience because they didn't get like yeah. the best version of that um, due to the interruption, but it happens. It, it happens all the time and there's not really anything you can do to prevent it. I know some people who bring multiple laptops to a conference because of stuff like that, who bring like one Mac and one uh, Windows laptop mm -hmm. just because of yeah, things like that being possible. It, it can be a tip, you know, the, the one that the, the one that can uh, do anything about things, but yeah, if you're running a live or demo, yeah. things that happen and then there is nothing, uh, you can do, uh, but uh, I think that the, the idea is to try to exit from it as 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 normal as you can. But uh, yeah, it's difficult. <laughs> yeah, you got to be as graceful as you can about it. But it is hard because you're you're panicking the whole time, and the audience is maybe like they're either staring at you awkwardly, like way too quiet, or maybe like somebody's laughing, and it's just it's overall an unpleasant experience. But it happens to everybody in DevRel eventually, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Kate. So really, thank you for your time. Uh, you, you you woke up a little uh, earlier for us, so uh, thank you for your time. It, yeah, it was great to having you. And I will be uh, contacting you and all other uh, advocates, uh, developer advocates that we have, to do something uh, uh, together for the uh, for the community. So, Brad, thank you very much. <laughs> no problem. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.